In our last few videos, we've shown how Latin America, or the elusive idea of Latin America, destabilizes our conceptions of geography, history, and identity. That is, space, time, and self. It is hard to say where Latin America is, or when it com comes into being, if indeed it has done so yet. Moreover, the place, or again, the idea, even makes us question who we are. We've described all this as a crisis of representation, whose traces can be found right at the mythic point of Latin American origin, 1492. Moreover, as 1492 is also the founding moment of the modern age, modernity in turn is characterized and affected by this same crisis. We've looked at this crisis mostly in terms of aesthetic representation, the attempt to portray things in words or images or some other medium. We showed, for instance, how Columbus battles with words and how the Castor paintings struggle to provide a comp comprehensive visual record of colonial society and its racialized hierarchies. But there is also political representation, the process by which decisions are made or articulated by some people on behalf of others. It's in this sense that we elect representatives to Parliament, for instance. These two meanings of the term, the aesthetic and the political, portrait and proxy, are related in that they both describe one thing standing for another. But they're also distinct, if never fully separable. And it is political representation that comes to the fore at the point at which Latin America, though remember that the name has yet to be invented, comes to throw off its colonial masters. At issue, in other words, is who gets to make and enforce the political, legal, and economic decisions that affect the inhabitants of the Americas, and what rights those inhabitants have to influence or resist such decisions. In the late 18th century, governance, representation, and rights were concerns both sides of the Atlantic. In the 1750s, aggrieved colonists in North America spread the slogan, no taxation without representation, to protest the fact that economic decisions impacting the British colonies were made without any political input from the colonists themselves. In July 1775, the Second Continental Congress, meeting in Philadelphia, issued a declaration of the causes and necessity of taking up arms to justify the rebellion that had broken out against the Crown earlier that year. Noting that Parliament in Westminster asserted the right to make laws to bind us in all cases whatsoever, the rebels objected that not a single man of those who assume so enormous, so unlimited a power is chosen by us or is subject to our control or influence. Almost exactly a year later, the same Congress then declared independence for the United States of America. This American Revolution was then an influence, alongside the writings of philosophers such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau, on the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen that was issued by the French National Constituent Assembly in the heat of the Revolution of 1789. This document opens by proclaiming that men are born and remain free and equal in rights. The diffuse transatlantic interchange of new ideas and rebellious sentiments then continued as slaves in the French Caribbean colony of Saint-Domingue seized on this notion that freedom and equality 
were sanctioned by a now official discourse of universal rights. In 1791, they rose up against the plantation owners, initiating a revolutionary process that gave birth to the independent Republic of Haiti. All this is the context to Simon Bolivar's letter from Jamaica of 1815. Like the North American colonists before him, Bolivar complains that the hemisphere's inhabitants have been excluded from the decision-making processes that affect them. Politically, they were non-existent, he says. The Spanish Empire, he asserts, has kept us in a sort of permanent infancy with regard to public affairs. And like the French, his critique is premised on a discourse of inherent natural right. Is it not an outrage and a violation of human rights, he asks, to expect a land so splendidly endowed, so vast, rich and populous, to remain merely passive. Then there's a nod to Haiti in Bolivar's invocations of slavery. A people is enslaved, he tells us, when the government infringes upon and usurps the rights of the citizen or subject. So Bolivar's letter translates and interprets for a new context a radical discourse that has ricocheted between the old world and the new, south and north. He lays the foundation for a tradition that will be revised and reinterpreted by would-be revolutionaries and reformers right up to the present, as Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez's 2004 speech to the G15 summit shows. In the Jamaica letter, Bolivar reveals himself Chavez claims, as an anti-imperialist leader, whose words resonate both with 20th century anti-colonial movements in South Asia and Africa, and also with contemporary struggles against neoliberalism. But there were other contexts too, and other legacies from the pronouncements of the so-called liberators of the Latin American wars of independence. We might, for instance, be alert to Bolivar's hyperbolic insistence that the inhabitants of the Americas were in a position lower than slavery. Many of the people whom he was addressing were, after all, themselves slaveholders, masters rather than slaves. The Creole elite in Spanish America saw the Haitian Revolution as threat as much as inspiration. Like the white planters of Saint-Domingue, they too might find themselves the losers rather than the beneficiaries of any truly radical transformation that took the discourse of rights, let alone a long history of cruelty, too seriously. Equally, there were parts of the Americas that had been shaken by resurgent indigenous opposition to colonial rule, most spectacularly with the 1780 uprising led by Tupac Amaru II in what is now Peru. Such rebellions showed that resistance to the colonial status quo drew not only on lofty European ideas, but also on deep-seated resentment of injustices in which the local elites were fully complicit. No wonder that Bolivar should also say, in his disillusioned final years, the governing America was like trying to plow the sea. The Creole discourse of independence drew on a multitude of sources of protest that it then tried uneasily to rearrange in its own image, according to a logic and order dictated by a privileged minority who saw themselves as the continent's rightful leaders. To put this another way, if the notion of political representation comes to the fore at this point, this is because the spokesmen of the independence movement were those who most keenly felt its lack. For them, being marginalized from the official hierarchies of political power 
threaten their economic freedoms regarding taxation and commerce, etc. But also left them helpless in the face of a crisis of governance in which their own position, in fact much higher than slavery, was at risk. Whereas for others, rather more basic freedoms were still at stake. Bolivar's conclusions are ambivalent. He predicts that we march majestically toward that great prosperity for which South America is destined. Yet, he foresees struggles over the political form that the new polities will take. But the Bolivarian dream of a patria grande or great fatherland, of continental unity under the guidance of inspired visionaries, tends to gloss over these internal fissures and elide the question of who has most and least to gain. Bolivar ends up arguing for paternal governments for which vast swathes of the population will continue in permanent infancy. Jose Martí's Our America is a much more difficult text than either Bolivar or Chávez's. And in many ways, you may be relieved to hear, that's more about him than it is about you. Yet it's difficulty that perhaps makes it more interesting than the other two. It's a sign of how hard it is to pin Martí down, but also how important it might be to try, that well over a century after his death, people are still arguing over his legacy, not least in the homeland from which he was so frequently exiled. He's a hero to the Cuban state, portrayed as a forerunner of Castro's revolution. But he's also claimed by that state's bitterest opponents. He lends his name to Radio Mati, the Miami-based radio station dedicated to broadcasting anti-Castro sentiments to the island. Mati was many things. Journalist, poet, translator, diplomat, essayist, political activist, rebel. In our America, we see how these different roles contaminate each other. This essay, first published in a New York Spanish language magazine, has come to be seen as one of the most important statements of Latin American identity, a rallying call for political movements of all stripes. But its difficulty arises in part because it is also an intensely, sometimes maddeningly, literary text. Take the essay's use of metaphor and allegory. Now, with a metaphor, one thing substitutes for another in order to reveal something new about the now absent original. For instance, Shakespeare's famous line, all the world's a stage, replaces world with stage in order to highlight the ubiquity of performance. An allegory is metaphor extended, as in Shakespeare's following lines, which develop and complicate this idea. And all the men and women merely players, they have their entrances and exits. In our America, we find metaphor and allegory throughout. If you have the text with you, pause this video now and look at a paragraph or two. Start by identifying, even counting, the metaphors you see. Then think about how they extend into allegories. And ask yourself if they clarify the essay's argument or cloud it. While you do that, I fancy some juice. But I'll be right back. So, what did you find? I hope you noticed that Marti's prose is crawling with metaphors. In the opening paragraph, for instance, the Americas are a sleepy hometown and its inhabitants prideful villagers surrounded by giants in seven-league boots. With this mention of boots, plus a reference to the villagers' sleeping cap, 
begins a series of references to clothing. At the same time, this very paragraph also gives us martial or warlike substitutions, as weapons become pillows and ideas trenches. And so it goes on. Ideas are also clouds, Americans are jealous brothers, nations are fluttering leaves or trees, the trees form ranks like soldiers, the soldiers move in lines like veins of silver, and all this only 20 lines in. Now, it's hard to avoid metaphor even at the best of times. To say, for instance, that our America is crawling with metaphors is already implicitly metaphorical, raising images of insects or the like, for metaphors don't literally crawl. Indeed, in some sense, all language is metaphorical, in that, as we've seen in early, earlier videos, it involves the use of signs, words or things that point to something, but can't quite take their place. Yet, in Marty's case, the metaphors are superabundant. Each paragraph is a thicket full of them that impedes our journey through the text. In part, this is a matter of style. Late 19th century authors and Latin American essayists are classes of writers who tend towards the florid, the digressive, and the ornate. Yet Marti seems to revel in these stylistic quirks, even as he champions the natural man who he says, strong and indignant, comes and overthrows the authority that is accumulated from books. In short, style and content often here seem to be at odds. No wonder this text has led to such contradictory interpretations. Are we back at our crisis of representation? Yes, but Marti makes a virtue of it. For despite his appeals to authenticity, nature and the natural man, and his critique of imported adornment, English trousers, a Parisian waistcoat, a North American overcoat, his emphasis is less on unveiling some solid reality beneath the artifice than on creativity. Salvation lies in creating, he says. Create is this generation's password. Indeed, continuing the clothing metaphor, it's not that Americans should not dress up, but that they should be more thoughtful about the motley garb with which they drape themselves, open to disjunction rather than wishing difference away through fictions of natural or national unity. They should combine the Indian headband and the judicial robe, Marti says, to undam the Indian, make a place for the able black. Even freedom is a matter not of innate rights, but of judicious, judicious dressmaking, as Marti argues for tailoring liberty to the bodies of those who rose up and triumphed in its name. And governing is an art, not an exercise in statistics. The crisis of aesthetic representation will resolve the crisis of politics. Marti wants more and better and more creative narratives of independence. For it is precisely in the fact that words are not fixed to things that the region's liberty is to be found, and that Latin America might escape the rising threat that our America identifies as coming from the North.